actually know who she was, but I just kind of thought, oh, she's one of those people that go, people go on about, like Emma Goldman or Bakarin, that I should really read sometime. So I went, yeah, I'd love to write a graphic biography of Rosa Luxemburg. And then I looked up who she was, and uh, I found this. And to be honest, I was blown away. I, I, I said to Donna, my partner, um, my God, she looks like a 1980s German squatter girl. She doesn't look like an Edwardian heroine. And, and he said, no, you've got that the wrong way around. The 1980s German squatter girls look like Rosa Luxemburg. <laughs> um, so the more I found out about her, the more enthused I was and the more incredibly grateful I was and continue to feel to Paul Bull, to the Rosa Luxemburg Foundation and to Verso and to Seth, Seth de Bockman for suggesting me in the first place. Um, because she is such an inspiring and inspirational character. So not only do I have this amazing person to create a comic about, I also have this really amazingly forgiving and interesting format with which to make her story come to life. So what I'm taking here is the fact of her haircut. I'm pretty sure she cut her own hair here. I'm pretty sure she didn't get a barber to do it. <laughs> And from that, I developed this page of... This is actually the point where I started drawing the roughs here. These are the first pictures that I did of Rosa for it. Um, and then this is the inked version, which I would have done about nine months later. Um, this is just her pondering in front of the mirror. This is, a, this is an invented scene that I've used to add gravitas to that actual historical fact. And then I can go further from that. I can then invent dialogue around peripheral characters, again, always based on these historical realities. Um, and, um, and then I can add drama. So um, here we have Rosa's parents in Warsaw, sitting over the dinner table. Ah, it's a letter from Rosa, and she sent a photograph. Ah. <laughs> what is it? Perhaps it's best if you don't see the picture. I want to see the photograph. It's not such a good likeness. I'll put it away. Give it to me! God in heaven, give me strength. What has the girl done to her hair? <laughs> um, it's not actually her hair that's the most exciting thing about Rosa Luxemburg. It's that she was an economist, a lecturer, a journalist, a theorist, and a revolutionary socialist with style. Um, this is an actual quote from a letter she wrote to her lovely Leo Yorgish. I don't say Yorgish. I want to affect people like a clap of thunder, to inflame their minds with the breadth of my vision, the strength of my conviction, and the power of my expression. So um, I was like, I really want to do something about the money system and how it affects our lives. So finding Rosa's story was a gift to me at a really good time in my life and in my artistic development. It's quite easy to do with her story. First, introduce the incredible inequalities that exist within capitalism. Because in 19th century Warsaw, these existed side by side. So here we have Rosa at school. I wish I had my own pony. but Papa says I could write my sisters, but it's not the same. And then you have child labour. And it's existing in the same place, in the same town. These are the inequalities that these days span the globe. But they're, they're, they're concentrated in the one um, place. Here we have starving people, and then we have the incredible luxurious banquets. Um, and this, I, I, I wrote in my book, you know, Warsaw is the centre of um, industry for the Russian Empire, and um, absolute wealth and utter destitution jostle in uneasy juxtaposition, to which my sister wrote on Facebook, well, it's a good thing we don't have that juxtaposition anymore, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> so this is an actual quote that Rosa said at the time, I want to burden the conscience of the affluent with all the suffering and all the hidden bitter tears. It is probably unlikely that she would have carved it into a desk with a knife. <laughs> so I really do want to inflame people like a clap of thunder. I want people reading the book to get a kind of taste of the effect that reading Das Kapital had on me when I was a young woman at the same age that Rosa would have read it. Um, and I wanted to simplify Das Kapital and I wanted to, to put this inequality and put it very clearly in a, within the context of the money relations that occur in, within capitalism. So I have Rosa sitting at the dinner table explaining Das Kapital to her brothers. Again, this is an invented dialogue, but I'm using the comic book form here to introduce the basic um, ideas behind, cap behind Marxism and behind capitalism, which Rosa will then build on during the book. This is the labour theory of value in one page. And um, this, 
This is the, the little phrase that really struck me when reading Capital the first time. We have material relations between persons and social relations between things. And here's my invented explanation of it. We treat objects like people. We desire them. We fetishize them. We treat them as valuable. We expect them to make us happy. And we treat people like objects. A person isn't a person anymore. He's a jeweler or a miner, a beggar or a boss. You don't have to just use my ideas of what Marxism means. I can use Rosa Luxemburg herself. And I read everything I could find of her collected works that was available in English. And, um, and then I went through this in incredibly difficult process of finding the bits that will translate into comic book form, the bits that are tweetable, if you like, which isn't easy because, to be honest, it seems like 19th century socialists were paid by the word. <laughs> <laughs> and then there were other times where I just found, like, phrases and bits of it that just made, literally made the hairs on the back of my neck stand up. So I really enjoyed the process, and I also really enjoy the fact that I'm able to bring Rose's work to people who really won't be asked to do that. So um, this is her explanation. What I've done here is I've taken her introduction to political economy, and I've condensed it massively. And I have her in the party school explaining this to people, and then that works as an explanation to the reader. One, so these are all quotes from her work. One cannot imagine anything simpler and more harmonious than this the life of the so-called primitive. The immediate needs of everyday life and the equal fulfillment of everyone, that is the starting point and end point of the economic system. Everyone works for everyone else and collectively decides on everything. Why? Because we have communism of the land and the soil, the common possession of the means of production on the part of those who work. The same village, but now we see it in modern times. Common property ceases to exist and along with it, the common labor and common will that regulates this. We have the money economy. All interactions are based upon exchange. What does this mean? Each person is now on his own. The farmer, the shoemaker, the goose herd, etc. The community has no longer anything to say to him. No one can order him to work for the whole, nor does he anyone bother about his needs. Each person's share of the late social labor is dictated by the market. Whatever he can sell, he labors at. Whether he can sell it determines whether he's rewarded. Social wealth is no longer distributed according to need. It matters not to the market whether our labourer has two mouths to feed or ten. The community that was previously a whole has been broken up into individual little particles. Each person now floats like a piece of dust in the air and wonders how he will manage. What the whole book's about, because I also get to draw sex scenes, which is a first for me, and it's also a lot of fun. Because with Rose's life, you can set up a conventional uh, heteronormative plot. Pl is it? Sorry, is all heteronormative? I really searched for some lesbianism, but there wasn't any. I tried. Okay. <laughs> I got really excited when she was writing to Henrietta Holst at one point, and then I discovered the bit that she was writing at that point was to Henrietta Holst's boyfriend, and I was like, no. So, um, but anyway, so but anyway, you can set up this boy meets girl conventional romantic plot art and then you can radically subvert it. Okay, so this is an imagined meeting between Rosa and Leo Yorgish. Work for international working class solidarity. The need for revolution breaks through national boundaries. Resisting capitalist annexation and imperialist war is not the same thing as dismantling capitalism. One does not flow from the other. And why this slavish adherence to Marxist dictates? We are not his disciples. Question everything. So I write, Rosa Luxemburg. <laughs> And Leo Yogi says, together they're ready to conquer the world in the name of the proletariat, of course. <laughs> right, um, I've had some feedback on the book now, and um, this is from Goodreads, and it's really bizarre. <coughs> okay, I don't know where the guy's got these pre-publication copies from, but he goes, I will admit that I still didn't understand the whole concept of socialism, so I guess I should pick up that Karl Marx book if I ever get interested in it for whatever reason. <laughs> but the whole graphic novel was built around her teaching and conceptions of capitalism, how it controls the universe, and how it brings about poverty and societal restrictions due to po the poverty. I am quite pleased that somebody who's picked up this book, who has no interest in Rosa Luxemburg whatsoever, still managed to take that away from it. <laughs> <laughs> and the um, historical research and the
the quality of art in your thing, the first thing that happens to me is my hand sympathetically aches. Because <laughs> I imagine how much time you spent drawing on it. Can you tell me about how much time you put into this thing and what that was like? Well, the roughs were really hard because, I don't know, I had a completely unrealistic expectation of how long it would take to draw the roughs. In fact, you spend ages doing the roughs and then you end up with a drawing that looks rubbish at the end of it, which is really distressing. But a lot of the time, I was meticulously arranging the characters on the page. And it's like I had complete artistic control over the way that they looked and the way that they moved and the way that they acted. So I spent quite a long time drawing her talking like this, then changing the hands and going like that, and then going like that sort of thing. So, so I, 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 I thought I'd be able to... It took six months to do the roughs. And, and I get very distracted along the way as well, because that was where I had to do the visual research, and then I had to research the First World War. And God, when I was 14, I just had an obsession about the First World War, and then I massively rediscovered it. And then a week later, I was Googling gas gangrene and rats coming out of people's eyes and stuff. And then, <laughs> oh God, I've got to pull myself back. <laughs> and then I missed a hell of a lot of deadlines. Although I did get married, move house, get bereaved, oh, loads of stuff happened, do you know what I mean? Because yeah. life happens, doesn't it? Of course. And then I ended up with three and a half months to do the actual artwork, and I did it in three and a half months, and I had ten days off in that time, and that included Christmas. About that to you. And I have two children, and it just involved 16-hour days, sitting there with basically a bar of green and black chocolate a day, <laughs> drawing from about 9am, and then having like a a 40 minute micro nap and then going back to it. And it would get back to about eight or nine in the evening, which would be the time when you'd want to knock off. And I'd go, yeah, fine, but now I have to shave them both. And I'd do it till 11 a.m. I would go to bed and I would get up and do it again. Sneak uh, to larger questions. At the end of the book, after Rosa's murder, you have, um, I hope I'm not that spoiling. Uh, you have a, um, <laughs> yes, <laughs> you have a um, scene where there's a young woman at her grave and you're talking about her ideas, how her ideas you know, could be reborn, and then you have scenes from various global protest movements like Occupy or from you know, places in other countries. Can you talk to me a bit about what protest movements now and um, what would be revolutionaries now would have to learn from Rosa Luxemburg? Um, well, her theory of spontaneity is always going to remain relevant because it's something that she found on the streets, you know, she was she was looking at how ideas can spark off and she was very much against any idea of top down um, of top down organising. She was like you can't call a mass strike. A mass strike is something that happens. And you can watch her experiences in the nineteen oh five revolution and then you can take them and look at like the Arab Spring, uh, the um, protests in Egypt and the way that that had its roots in a mass strike movement and go, well that just did it all over again. So it's very easy to draw parallels and update her work like that. I mean, th th there, are, there are aspects of her ideas that I disagree with. I mean, they were writing at a time when socialism was perceived to be inevitable. And she struggles a lot of the time with the idea that, well, all the working classes are just going to get together and sort it out because Marx said it's got to be like that. And then she's like, well, maybe they're not going to. So how do we make that happen? And obviously history, you could say, well, capitalism has proved more adaptable and more tenacious than she or Marx predicted. There's a sense, a very simplistic sense about 19th century socialism, that there is a science. The science is the science of history. We have cracked the science of history, and this and this and that is going to happen in this order. And I've always identified more as an anarchist. I would say that anarchy is more of a philosophy of studying how to resist oppression from the ground level to the top level and making that theory work in all aspects of your life. Whereas I, and I'm going to get some stick for this, tend to think of socialism as a bit more like a religion, where it's like, my faith is in Marx, Marx will tell us what to do, and my early experience with going and joining the socialist movement would involve things like, well, if you do join the Socialist Worker Party and everyone joins the Socialist Worker Party, then we'll all be members of the Socialist pa Workers' Party and then this utopia will happen. <laughs> However, where she differs, for, even from the people that she was associated with in the Spartacus uprising, is she had this really base belief in democracy. Um, she, she says, like, we have to win the hearts and minds of everyone to make this happen. So the only thing that she was doing was trying to reach the maximum number of people to make these massive um, political shifts possible. 
And we'll, when Carl Liebknecht takes the initiative and um, sort of instigates the Spartacist uprising, he does it without Rosa Luxemburg's consent. And she turns around to him and says, Carl, is that our programme? She's not committed to this putschist idea that you seize control and then you make everything happen in the name of the proletariat. She's very, very, very democratic. And I think that that, especially with the advent of the new ways that we have of communicating, the idea of a genuine democracy where people can be educated to a high level and who can participate and can decentralise power down in a meaningful way, those ideas are incredibly relevant. What do you think the role of beauty in the revolution is? Oh, uh, yeah, I, it's really lovely studying Rosa with that idea because she is so sensual, she is so immersed, and she, she gets really upset about wasps. She, this woman fed wasps in prison. Like at that point, she was living in Ronca Fortress and she had a little garden, but then they move her to Barnstrap women's prison and she doesn't have a garden anymore so she opens the window of her cell and she has some jam and a saucer and she has all these wasps coming in and she's feeding them and then they're going out again she has got the most intimate connection with living beings and that is totally what inspires her is so it's not just an intellectual opposition to imperialism she's incredibly closely connected to the suffering of people around the world and I think that that emotional response at the heart of what she does is what gives it its power. She says, in order to write from the heart, you have to live what the words that you're writing. And she's very scathing of the same old propaganda that's being put out. She says, like, we don't need this stuff just to be repeated. We don't want people re repeating the same tired old phrases. She says, the secret of writing is to live the subject fully in one's heart. I want to thank you so much for creating this book and for speaking with me. It's really oh. honor. Thank you.